Yeah, so, you know, one of the good things that comes out of having COVID is that you get um, to uh, what, what we believe is a, a very extensive natural immunity. Uh, the, the individuals who got sick 17 years ago with the original SARS-CoV-1 are still immune from it today, 17 years later. Oh, wow. And so we believe people... Uh, and, and and all all the evidence to date tells us that people who who had COVID, who had symptoms of COVID, had COVID, are uh, have a, a very robust uh, not only antibody immunity but more importantly a T cell immunity, and uh, and that's that's good news. Mm. Nobody, you know, the goal is to not is to not have to go through COVID. Um, that that's the ultimate the, the initial goal, but. The reality is that now that the the variants have been mutating to the point where they're more infectious, thankfully they're not more deadly. They're actually much less deadly than the original variants were, uh, but they they are more infectious. There, are, you know, some studies suggest about sixty percent more likely to get you infected. And well, I think what we've been noticing is that many of us who I keep hearing every day, you know, I spent the last year and a half, got through everything just fine, no problem. And all of a sudden the Delta variant got me, right? And uh, that's what your experience was, Susan. And, uh, you know, so, so I think we need to be prepared to, you know, what do we do if we get COVID? You know, do we just kind of wait until we get sick enough and then go to the hospital and get treatment? Uh, and that, that's not a very smart way to do it. And so you know, there's been doctors um, around the world who have championed the, the approach of early treatment at home, early medical treatment at home. Of course, we've been championing, championing all along the idea of early natural treatments at home that can be combined with potential early medical treatments at home to prevent you from actually having to check into the hospital. And so I know, Susan, that you actually ended up at the ER once or twice, but, but uh, fortunately, you never had to be checked into the hospital. <laughs> and, uh, and that's good. You know, the, the, uh, the ultimate goal with COVID is to not end up in the hospital and, of course, primarily not to end up dead. Those are the two primary goals with COVID. Everything else is much less important. Uh, uh, after after you've addressed the you know the, the initial goal of hopefully preventing it in the first place. So okay. uh, when we look at the topic of synergy, if if you look at our YouTube channel, Brighton Heights YouTube channel, this is now the tenth webinar that has been done uh, on a monthly basis to to uh, address all the things that can be done to improve vitality, vitality and health in every sense of the term, especially for those of us as, as we're getting older. I'm in my 60s now, so I'm paying attention to this. I'm starting to think about retirement and where I'm going to live and, you know, and, and, and how that relates to the rest of my family and so forth. And so that's what Brighton Heights is all about, is, is promoting a, a community that supports vitality in the individual, in the couples. And, uh, and, and, um, and so today we wanted to kind of bring it all together, all the things that we've discussed up until now, how they come together uh, with this optimization or synergizing of where the sum of the parts when pulled together are much more powerful then if you just add up all the benefits of the separate parts um, uh, individually. So, so that's the power of synergy is how we can exponentially increase vitality. And vitality can be thought of physically. Uh, it can be taught, thought of as, as mentally, as, uh, as um, you know, socially, and the, uh, having vitality in all those categories. But... You know, if we don't have vitality in our immune system, all those things go out the window, right? So, so vitality is critical to our immune system. And every single seminar, webinar that we have done to date really are, are, are pieces of the puzzle to optimize the vitality of our immune system. So I thought there was no better uh, 
way to address this topic today than to put it within the context of the Delta COVID-19 variant and how, and how synergy of these lifestyle factors and natural factors can powerfully help us not only prevent developing the problem, but if we do get infected, prevent that from turning into a moderate or, to, or severe symptomatic illness that then requires hospitalization and, and puts a strain on our hospital system, which is already medical professionals at, at hospitals are just basically stressed out. They've, they've been working hard for the last year and a half and, you know, it just keeps coming. Right, just no matter what, you know, even with with uh, seventy percent, roughly of the population with at least one vaccine, it just keeps coming. It's 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 going to become an endemic thing, and, and we're flat, there's every state of the union is running into a nursing shortage right now. Yeah. In other words, in other words, we have to be really careful with our own lives, with our own health, because. Because the way the healthcare system is being strained right now, so we may not have access okay, in the near future if things get worse, right? We may not have access because, because so, so many nurses are, are literally saying, we're done, we're done. And, and, um, and so we need, to, we need to become more aware and more educated about the things that we can do at home in, in the early course to both prevent and properly manage our health such that if we do need to be hospitalized, it doesn't need to be an ICU, right? Uh, it can be, or, or we can just go to the ER, get some oxygen uh, and get sent home with some medications. Uh, so the, yeah. I wanna start maybe by, by uh, sharing, sharing my screen on, um, on some, uh, on a, actually a paper that was written by one of the many doctors that has, has uh, emphasized, emphasized the value of, of early home treatment. You know, one of the mistakes yes. that we all made uh, early in the pandemic is just tell people, just go home and wait, okay? And, and maybe after a couple of weeks, if you can't breathe, you know, like, like you, you know, you got to the point, Susan, where you couldn't breathe uh, uh, very well. And, you know, you went to the ER and, and they knew what to do, but they, fortunately, they did not, they did not um, uh, check you into the hospital. They said, here's the things that you can do. And that worked, right? And so, but earlier on, we just wait, had people wait and not do anything and, until it was literally too late. And so what, what I'm going to share now um, uh, I'm gonna sh I'm gonna share screen, and this this is um, this this is a a a paper uh, written um, and published in the um, Infectious Diseases uh, Journal for the Henry Ford Health System Scholarly Commons, and this was as you can see here in December 30, 2020. So this this has been out now for over eight months. And it was called the multifaceted, highly targeted sequential multi-drug treatment of early ambulatory high-risk SARS-CoV-2 infections. In other words, this is a, a, a broad-based strategy uh, on what drugs could be used sequentially if, they, if the first several didn't work well enough. That could be done at home. They could be prescribed at home through telemedicine. Uh, so that people didn't have to go to the hospital or go to a clinic or infect other people along the way and get treatment that's appropriate, that makes sense medically and physiologically and get that early treatment um, early enough so that th this approach is believed would have saved 85% of all the deaths that occurred from COVID-19 in the last year and a half. Okay, so this is, in other words, if we didn't pay attention to this before, at least we should be paying attention to it now, 
right? Now, the good news is that while the Delta Absolutely. is more infectious, it is, uh, it is much, much less deadly. But people who are not paying attention to early treatment, you know, Susan, your, your situation may have been very different if you didn't get early treatment. You know, can you imagine if you if you hadn't Absolutely. done if you hadn't been aware of the things that we're going to talk about today, you know, you literally might not be here today. Okay, I mean that I I, I hate to think about that. I agree. But I know of many people that that are our age that that didn't make it because it's like, and this is usually men, like ah, I'm good, you know, I'll be fine, you know, <laughs> I'll be fine. And, and then, you know, three days later, it's like, oh, man, I'm not fine at all. But if you would have started, if, if that person would have started early medical treatment, even just three days later, it made all the difference in the world. Okay, so, so uh, never before in medicine have we been so hesitant to get early treatment for anything. Okay, and so, so here's this paper that was then subsequently published in reviews of, of cardiovascular medicine. And, um, and, uh, and as you can see, there's 57 doctors from all over the country, hospital systems all over the country that, that participated in putting this paper together uh, along with the leadership of Dr. Peter McCullough. And so, and I'm, I just wanna highlight one thing, that, that paper, well, we can put a link into the, uh, uh, on, uh, on the YouTube information section in our YouTube channel about this uh, late after the talk. So you can, you can look this up, but basically I'm going to, this, this is the, um, this is the, the uh, protocol, if you will, that was developed by this team of 57 doctors uh, that, that, and, and again, this was published in the reviews of cardiovascular medicine, which COVID is essentially you die because of blood clots. That's the main reason people die. Blood clots that form in the lungs, these are very small micro blood clots that form in the capillaries of the lungs and you basically uh, suffocate, okay? So the lungs are working fine. It's just that the, there's not, there, the blood isn't carrying the oxygen to the rest of the body because there's blood clots there. So, so basically there, there's this protocol that's available that talks about early medical intervention and it starts out by saying, if you're under 50, okay, the, basically, um, the, and, and you don't have any, any other, what we call comorbidities, where you have your diabetes or heart disease or hypertension or asthma, et cetera, um, or cancer, okay, then you can just get, get the nutraceutical bundle, they call it. Uh, basically, it's a group of vitamins like zinc and vitamin D and, and uh, vitamin C and quercetin, et cetera. Um, there, there's a whole broader list of natural strategies based on medical research that's on, on my website, drjoungberg.com, if you want a more expanded version of that. Uh, but then it goes into, if feasible, use the, and this is very available now, the, the monoclonal antibodies. You know, that President Trump got monoclonal antibodies when he got COVID. And, and you know, there's, there's basically millions and millions of doses of that available just sitting around not getting used. So if you, if you end up sick, you don't even have to go to the hospital for this. You can go to the clinic. You can go to uh, an urgent care and get infused with monoclonal antibodies. And that's basically where you're basically be infusing these soldiers, these antibodies that can help fight the, the, uh, the virus, the COVID-19 virus and, and help destroy it, right? So that you can, so it doesn't keep replicating and overwhelm your body. So, and then, and then there's, uh, and then if you, if you have uh, continued symptoms, then, then you can use some type of intervention like ivermectin or azithromycin or doxycycline, et cetera. Now, um, and this goes on and there's a whole, you know, there's a whole protocol here where you can do inhaled budesonide or other forms of steroids to lower the inflammatory phase of this illness. And you're, again, your medical providers can help guide you through that. 
And, um, and then there's, there's aspirin. There's an appropriate time to use aspirin if you're in the inflammatory phase. Uh, and then there's, uh, there's uh, anticoagulants, antithrombotics. Because remember, the blood tends to clot in COVID, especially if, this, if you're starting to have low oxygen pressure okay, or, or uh, a, a low percentage of oxygenation in your blood uh, as measured by a pulse oximeter, then, uh, then you know that the more likely reason for the dropping oxygen levels in your, in your blood is because you got micro blood clots preventing your lungs from transferring oxygen into the bloodstream and to your brain and to your tissues and so forth. Um, so, so, so there's, there is a early medical treatment paradigm that is critical, as I said earlier, has, has uh, been estimated that 85% of all the people that died from COVID wouldn't have died if they had just had access to good early treatment. So, right. so you get sick, demand good early treatment. And you can get that most of the time right at home through telemedicine, calling your doctor or calling some doctor that's willing to actually treat you early. So, um, uh, Susan, the uh, uh, this is a, maybe a good time for you to tell us your own experience because you know you're just you're just on the tail end of this yourself. Um, yeah. It was, uh, yeah, well, just start at the beginning. Your daughter came home from a major event in Wisconsin and she had. Yeah, let me, yeah, yeah, let me tell the story. So she and my oldest daughter, my, my youngest daughter is 13. She had gone with my oldest daughter and her son and their kids and met other family up for the air show in Oshkosh. That's every summer. And they had just gotten back and uh, they, you know, had like a 17 hour drive back from Wisconsin. As soon as she got out of the van, she said, I'm dizzy. And she had a cough. Now she had a cough before they went. So I wasn't as concerned about the cough, but the dizziness made no sense. Well, we were supposed to go to the ASI conference that week and, and I had tickets and everything. So I was like, well, I better get her checked out and this dizziness makes no sense. So I took her to urgent care and they said, well, we think she got dehydrated because she wasn't drinking enough in the car. So that could be that she just needs an IV. Take her to the ER so they can give her an IV. And while we're there, they did a COVID test and she tested positive. So by the time that was all done, I texted you, which was like, I don't know, 11, 11 at night, my time, you're three hours behind me. So fortunately it wasn't that late for you, but you immediately jumped on everything and, and got me connected with a, a, a doctor you know, behind the scenes to, to help us. But, you know, basically they threw it out, they threw us out of the ER as fast as they could. You know, it was very disheartening just to see how they handled the whole situation. And the ER nurse we were working with was, the, was you know, if I, if I didn't know you, the, the limited advice I would have gotten was to take a Centrum pill, seriously, from the ER nurse. The doctor never came back. I mean, you know, just bad. Well, anyway, so we go home, uh, we test ourselves and we tested negative on Tuesday because it was just too soon. But my daughter and son-in-law tested positive on Tuesday. I tested positive on Thursday. My husband tested positive on Saturday. And my two daughters and son-in-law, they came through it pretty easily. You know, they were, didn't feel good for about three days, but then after that, they were fine. And, and you know, the first thing I did, of course, was, you know, download your protocol and started following all the advice in there with uh, you know, the, the C and the D and the zinc and quercetin and all the other stuff, the iodine, the, the hydrotherapy. The hydrotherapy was the best thing of all of it. I really do believe in terms of benefit, but it's like, you have to do all of it, you know? And, and, but anyway, but my husband and I, we're not doing well. Our, our breathing, you know, I, I got the, um, as you told us to, we went and got the ox, what do you call it? Pulse oximeter to track our, um, you know, you stick your finger in there and um, it gives you a reading on your oxygen levels. And um, I quickly learned I could not sleep in my bed because my oxygen would drop below 90 and you don't want it to drop below 90. 
I knew I couldn't go outside or it would drop even farther than that. I couldn't go down my stairs. So I basically was living on my couch and just shuffling between the bathroom, the kitchen and the couch. Um, and I, you know, as long as I did that and did all the things, I knew I was surviving, but that's about it. Well, so the doctor uh, prescribed ivermectin for all of us. And my understanding is that that keeps the cell, the, the virus replication down, if I understand that correctly. Yeah, there's a great, there's a great meta-analysis done by uh, Dr. Tess Laurie out of the United Kingdom, who is one of the top researchers in the world on what's called a meta-analysis, uh, putting together all the studies that have been done on the topic and then um, establishing how effective this really is. And, and uh, she was so interested in the effect of ivermectin that she actually, uh, uh, pro bono, uh, without charging anything, did a study on this uh, and, and published it. And, and found that it's, it's actually uh, very effective at uh, preventing people from, in, from dying. That ultimately, it's, 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 it's a medicine that has been shown uh, to be very powerful at greatly limiting the risk of death from, uh, from moderate to severe COVID. So, so yeah, ivermectin, originally an uh, anti-parasitic, but extremely safe medicine. Uh, it's been used by the World Health Organization and promoted uh, for all around the world for river blindness, for parasitic diseases, very effective for that. Uh, but it, it's, it's been documented now since, since 2012 is a very broad spectrum antiviral that is actually effective against West Nile virus and, and Zika virus and, and just, just about any virus. It can be really effective. So, so it was, um, it was called a repurposed drug. It's, it was found by, the, um, by critical care physicians uh, all over the country to be really effective in dealing with their patients who were on, on the way to serious complications. And uh, so, so it's, uh, it's certainly a, a, a good thing to take advantage of as one of the medical interventions. Of course, we wanna be looking today uh, at you know taking advantage of everything that's available. Now we talk about the um, um, the multi-layer approach to protection, right? Uh, you don't just you don't just put one little layer on and say that's going to be enough. I don't need any more protection. When we're dealing with something mm -hmm. that can be deadly, you want to have as many layers of protection as is reasonable. And and yeah. so uh, ivermectin certainly is one of them. But um, you know, there's, there's, we already went over the multifaceted protocol for medical intervention that you can look up later on the link. Uh, but I, I, uh, before you tell the rest of your story, Susan, let me share screen. And I want, I want to, um, I want to uh, show you here. Let me share screen real quick. And um, here, I'll do it this way. Okay, so. Um, it's uh, Herbert Hoover, I want to pass president said, wisdom consists not so much in knowing what to do in the ultimate as in knowing what to do next. So that was your dilemma, Susan. Okay, now what? You know, I got this, I got diagnosed. I'm getting sicker. Uh, my oxygen levels are dropping. I, I know that that's bad. I, I want to do everything possible to stay out of the hospital and getting placed on a ventilator because soon as your oxygen levels start dropping, that's what they're thinking. You go to the hospital, they're thinking, well, we got to put her on a ventilator. Why do they do that? Because a ventilator basically doesn't allow you to spread your viruses throughout the room. It's self-contained. Yeah. Right? That, that's frankly one of the biggest reasons why they put you on a ventilator because a lot of people don't need to be on a ventilator. They just get put on a ventilator to prevent them from spreading the virus. Okay, uh, early on, we know that people were put on ventilators for that and other reasons, 70 to 80% of them died, just blew out their lungs, right? Uh, so, so yeah, you don't wanna be put on a ventilator just to prevent spreading of the virus. Have them send, them send you home with oxygen or with an oxygen concentrator, right? To increase your oxygenation, that would be a, a first more prudent step. And, um, and so, uh, and so what, what do we do next? Well, uh, to highlight that point, 
let me let me tell you a quick story. Uh, and uh, I remember I, um, I I've been speaking on how to optimize your immune system for um, well for for you know 30 years. I've been giving lectures on how to optimize your immune system. About 15 years ago, I was doing a talk entitled "How to Optimize Your Immune System uh, in the Winter Time," given the, the you know colds and flus and. And uh, a gentleman came up to me and told me the story of the Hutchinson, Minnesota, Seventh Avenue Seminary during the Spanish flu epidemic uh, in, in 1918. And it was a fascinating story, which I'll share with you briefly right now. And this is a story, I mean, this is a picture of that, uh, of that educational facility in Minnesota. <laughs> you can see a little bit of snow on the ground, typical Minnesota, just cold and dreary. I mean, it looks kind of miserable, doesn't it? And, um, and so 120 students and faculty are housed in this one uh, facility slash dormitory. Can you imagine if a couple of people got the Spanish flu with the death rate for the Spanish flu in 1918, was far, far, far higher than it is now for COVID-19. Can you imagine living in a dormitory like that, not having any medications at all uh, to address this problem? And you're thinking, we're all gonna die, right? I mean, that would be, that would be a reasonable expectation given what was happening across the country at that time. Well, the difference was, and I'm gonna read this to you, the difference was, and this was uh, this was published in in, uh, in a paper, actually in the Hutchinson um, uh, paper, and it, and it was uh, in, so I, there's a handout here if somebody wants it, we can make it available. But let me just read read a section of this, and it was entitled "Seminary Clinches the Flu." This is referring to the Spanish flu. Um, it, it it basically said this. Let me read it real quick. Um, 120 exposed, 90 patients, no deaths, none even very sick. Just, uh, just unprecedented for the Spanish flu since so many people are getting so seriously ill and dying. Well, says, and this is on the authority of Dr. Fred Shepard, health officer of Hutch Hutchinson City in Minnesota. It may be stated that no public institution in the state of Minnesota is up to date to 1918. Um, made a record of handling the Spanish flu, the worldwide epidemic that swept millions to their graves, like that to the credit of the Hutchinson Seventh Adventist Seminary. The seminary with 120 of its 180 students and teachers housed under one roof, this roof, <laughs> um, uh, was invaded by the malady three weeks previous. The symptoms of the malady that developed in some 90 of these, and under the direction of Dr. Larson, the physician in charge of the faculty and students, every person showing indication of sickness was at once put to bed with a trained nurse taking temperature and watching symptoms. Now, um, let, me, uh, let, let me just, I'm going to stop sharing screen here. Let me just make a couple of points here. This was a, a critical, critical piece of the solution. The, one of the biggest reasons why so many of us get sicker and sicker and sicker, and, and many of us ultimately succumb, end up in the hospital or succumb to this problem, is number one and primarily number one, because we have not rested appropriately. Okay? I think we, we are all at, uh, we're all guilty of this, myself included. And Susan, I'll call you out on this. I know that you were, <laughs> you were texting me while you were sick and you were going like, I'm working on this project. And you're probably emailing Katie there. You, you, were, you were probably just, oh, okay, I'm at home. I'll, I'll just get all this work done because you know we got a lot to do, right? And so in our world today, we don't have the time to, to, to do total rest. Okay, but that's a it, that sets us up. I, I will go out on the limb here, Susan. I, I bet you anything, and we won't know this for certain, 
But if you had had more total rest in the early days, along with, with uh, uh, really controlling your diet like you were, and the hydrotherapy, I bet you would have come out of that much better without the low oxygen levels, and you would have never actually had to go to the ER to get additional care. Okay, that, that's, that's, a, that's my guess. Okay, and, and, and of course, you know, there's you know, a lot of what ifs there. Uh, but, but so they well, were put the bed. True confession. I can say true confession. What I did in retrospect that was horrible is <laughs> I made meals for me and my daughter and son in law, and I took them to their house two days in a row. <laughs> and I started that on Thursday, and I was like, I'm too sick to do this. So Friday I stopped, but you're right. I did. I did some terrible things I should not have done. Yeah. So, so let me just make a point here. And, you know, we, we have, uh, uh, you know, various people watching this, many people watch this on YouTube. Uh, in fact, probably most of the people watch this program on YouTube or Facebook, not on zoom. Uh, but I, I think it's really critical to say this, that, that you got to have enough rest. You got to truly, truly rest because if you don't, you're setting yourself up that all the other therapies that are in of themselves, really valuable therapies are not going to work quite as well. And that could be the tipping point for you. And in fact, I'm suggesting is usually and customarily the tipping point why people start getting sicker because they're not taking the time to have what we refer to as complete bed rest. And, and that sounds like an anathema to us, complete bed rest. Are you kidding me? I got to do something to, you know, to, to show that I'm worth my hire, right? I got to do this work. I, I have enough energy to do that work. And so we think we should do it. Well, that's what sets you up for, for more serious illness. And it sets you up for long COVID. You do not want to have long COVID. This is where up to half of individuals who've had COVID have lingering symptoms many months. And now going on a year later, they're just not what they used to be. They don't have the energy they used to have. They don't have the stamina they used to have. They don't have the mental capacity they used to have. And, and so we don't want to risk that for a couple of days of a little bit of extra work while we're a little bit sick. And so, you know, I'm talking to myself here too, right? Cause I, I, I have that same problem. And I'm telling you, if you're concerned about this, the number one thing is you get to bed, you have complete bed rest, drink lots of water, hydrate, 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 eat a very mild or meager diet, really healthy plant-based diet, primarily, maybe some soups, you know, some tomato soup, something or so whatever agrees with you, something that's easy to digest. But don't don't like I got to eat breakfast, lunch and dinner, a good big meal. No, that your body's trying to recuperate. You don't want to be spending half of your energy, which is already waning on digesting food, right? You want to be focused on on, on letting the body optimize immune natural immunity to fight this battle if you're eating your ability to fight the battle temporarily you know goes on r and r right and you don't want to do that you don't want to let the enemy get a foothold if at all possible so so they they put the, uh, them on complete bed rest carefully regulated diet like i mentioned and fomentations now you might be thinking, what in the world is fomentation? You know, is that, you know, it sounds like somebody's foaming at the mouth. No, fomentations are a process. And this is an actual uh, Turkish towel or fomentation pad. You can see how thick this is. This is a really thick pad. And basically you get this wet, okay? You can use a regular towel as well. So not quite as good, but still effective. Uh, and so you get this wet and then you got to wring it out. You got to really wring it out. Cause if you, if you put this into a plastic trash bag and put this into your microwave and heat this up and it's dripping wet, you're going to burn, you're going to scald your skin. Don't do that. So you got to wring this out ahead of time. So it's thoroughly damp through and through, but not dripping at all, not soaked at all. You wring it out. 
then you put it into a, a plastic uh, trash bag uh, so that the heat will stay in and put it in a microwave. Every microwave is different, just heat it up so it's nice and hot. And then you basically put a towel, wrap a towel around this, put a towel down on your back. You can lay down on the floor or do it in, in the bed where somebody is. You put a towel down and then, and then you put, wrap this in a towel. You put this down on the bed or the floor on top of the towel, and then you lay down on it. So that now you're, you're, you're putting all this heated dampness is being transferred into towards your lungs through your back. And then you have another one of these towels or Turkish towels, and you basically, you put it across your front, okay? And, um, and again, heat it in the microwave. So you gotta have somebody working with you to do this. And, uh, you know, a, a family member or, or a, an aide that is supporting you on this. And then you do that for five, for basically four to five minutes. So you're you're going to have a cool uh, ice water cloth on your forehead, so your your brain doesn't get overheated. Okay, you can put your feet in a hot water bath to further increase your body temperature. What you're doing here is called uh, is called hydrothermal therapy, where you're increasing your temperature. You're essentially creating an artificial fever which is good, okay? The reason your body runs a fever is your body's trying to get better. Your body's trying to mobilize your immune system to fight the bacteria, or in this case, the virus, right? Or it could be both. And, and so this hydrothermal therapy dramatically increases. It, it, it helps break up the congestion in your lungs, if you have any. It helps stimulate your natural killer cell immunity, helps stimulate uh, the, the, the B cell immunity, which is production of antibodies against that virus. And so you do that for five minutes and then you have somebody take ice water in a, in a washcloth. And, uh, and I, I actually get one of these ice cubes or, or, uh, or, or ice little cooler blocks and then just rub it on the chest area and on the back area for about 30 seconds. Whew, that cools you off really quick. But it's that contrast between heat and cold that stimulates your immune system on both counts. The heat stimulates your immune system, and then the cold further activates your immune system, allowing you to produce interferon, which activates the immune system dramatically to, to uh, empower it to fight the virus at a much higher level. So hydrotherapy of this nature, of fomentation, is really powerful. Now, having somebody, if, if what about if you're by yourself, right? What if you, what if you're, uh, what's that? Don't forget, the, don't forget to mention the 20 minutes afterward. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Susan. So, so there, there's a couple of the methods you can use, but that's a very important concept is that uh, I actually was trained on hydrotherapy 35 years ago, but by, uh, the great Dr. Charles Thomas. He was an expert in hydrotherapy. He had his own clinic in Banning, California. And um, uh, he would do all kinds of physical medicine uh, techniques for, for people with stroke, strokes or uh, other, other problems. And um, he, he trained us uh, on how to do hydrotherapy. And he said, the most important part, number one, you do five minutes hot, 30 seconds cold, we call it ice mitten friction of cold, both sides. And then you dry that off and you put the hot back on. So you got to keep, keep microwaving these, these towels um, to, to keep it going. And they, so you do that back and forth three times, five minutes hot, 30 seconds ice cold, five minutes hot, 30 seconds ice cold, five minutes hot, 30 seconds ice cold. You end with the cold, dry off completely, and then bundle up in a dry sheet and blankets and just and rest completely. Don't do anything else, but just lay there for at least 20 minutes. And hopefully you fall asleep during that time. And of course that hot, cold therapy is kind of like having a massage. It's, it's kind of like a passive exercise, like massages, dramatically increasing 
circulation, helping break up those little clots in the lungs or wherever they might be, um, improving uh, antibody recognition of the virus and so forth, and uh, in natural killer cell, literally killing the virus on site. So all that is dramatically increased by this back and forth contrast, hot and cold. But then when you lay down and rest in, in a warm environment, bundled up for 20 minutes, that powerfully increases what's called spontaneous blastogenesis. It's an immunologic term, meaning that the, the lymph nodes all throughout your body where, where, where white blood cells reside and, and B cells of the white blood cells reside, these B cells turn into antibody factories and they start cranking out antibodies at a much higher level and it's that rest phase that allows that to be optimized. And so you want to make sure you want to make sure that you are that you are optimizing this this process. So so now there's there's a couple other strategies that are easier to use. Let's go let's go to the next one for for hydrotherapy. Uh, this is a this is the box where I got it. You see, I got this at Battle Creek equipment.com. I think that's the name of, uh, let's see. Now it's, it's Battle Creek equipment and it's called a thermophore. Okay, so this is so, so this is a thermophore. And let me just show you how this works. Uh, uh, when, when you order these, you want to get two of these. So th these are these are basically pretty big, right? So they'll they'll fit over the complete chest and back area. And they're electric, as you can see here. So that it's covered with a, a wool covering. And, and then it basically plugs into the wall. And then you can put one down on for your back, a towel over it, lay down on that, and then put one on your chest. And you just click this. So you click or you hold it down so that you're controlling the heat. So that you're not, uh, you know, all of a sudden stuck and you know and bundled up, and you're getting hotter and hotter and hotter, and you burn yourself. Okay, you're holding this, and as soon as you get too hot, you let go. Okay, and you until you until you're not quite so hot, then you you press it down again and you hold it. So you're going to have two of these, one for the front and one for the back. It's called a thermophore, and we'll put a link in the uh, um, on the on the website in the YouTube page for that. Um, so that, that you can get your own if you'd like. Um, and they're available at various places, but I just happen to get mine at Battle Creek Equipment um, in the Midwest um, where they specialize in that. So, so a thermophore can be used in the same way, but you don't have to, you know, you're not dealing with water now, you're, but you'd still do have to do the ice cold emitting friction uh, in between those sessions, right? So it's still a contrast heat therapy. Now, the, uh, the simplest thing that you can do, and I do this all the time. In fact, ever since COVID began, I do this every day, and it's called the contrast shower. It's hydrotherapy, but you do it in your own shower, standing in your shower. So if you're not super sick, right, uh, and, and if you start at the right time, you're not going to be super sick no matter what, right? So you just get in and you do these contrast showers. So you basically turn it to hot and then adjust it to as hot as you can tolerate it on your upper chest area uh, and your back area where the lungs are, okay? And you do that as, as hot as you can tolerate that and you keep adjusting that for basically at least three minutes, preferably maybe five minutes, three to five minutes. And then you should get to the point where you're like breathing heavy and you're taking deep breaths because you're hot, right? And you're feeling it, you're hot. And then you relieve that by going all the way cold. Now in California, Southern California, where I live, all the way cold isn't that cold. It's just kind of like cooler, right? And which, which is a problem because it's the contrast between the two that makes the biggest impact on your health and your immune system. But do the best you can. Uh, you can do a hot tub in a, in a pool too. In the wintertime, that's really good because the pool's cold. 
okay? And you go from really cold to, to 104 degrees and you can do that back and forth as well. But it's best in the shower so you can regulate a good heat right to your lungs and then cool for 30 seconds to a minute and then back and forth again three times. So that's, 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 those are three different techniques that are available. If you want to actually take a course on this, it's available at, at um, Life and Health uh, website, uh, lifeandhealth.org. Uh, there's a whole course on hydrotherapy. On my website, dryoungberg.com, there's, there's a, a section on optimizing your immune system. And I talk about how to optimize hot cold therapies. And I have videos of how to do a contrast shower and other links to that. So, so hydrotherapy, we, uh, I, I, we, pin, we spent quite a bit of time on that today. Uh, and Susan, you tell us why. Why do you think, why is that so important? Well, of all the strategies that were implemented, uh, certainly my experience, but even you know, my daughter, who's a nurse that did everything perfectly that I told her to do and I gave her your protocols, et cetera. She said the thing that made the most difference of everything was hydrotherapy. She went the three days that they were feeling bad, she took a hydrotherapy shower in the morning and another one at night. And she said that made all the difference. And, and for me, the hydrotherapy was the thing that made me feel the best. Like I could till I was, as soon as I did it, I could immediately tell I was feeling better. Like my body was responding. So I think it's the best thing. And I will tell you for myself, because I was having trouble breathing, I did it in the shower, but I, I couldn't do three minutes because it was just, I couldn't breathe. So I would open my shower door, I'd stick my head out and I would breathe. And then I just would do like a minute. And then I would do the 30 seconds cold, but because I would get so hot from just even the one minute, it just all felt good. And the contrast was, I knew it was what was important. And then I followed your advice and got in bed and, and just laid there for 20 minutes and I didn't even fall asleep. But I, I knew, because you explained it to me what was happening, that my body was producing the antibodies and it was it was ramping up. So it's I by, bar none, the hydrotherapy, I'd say is the biggest thing. You know, I'd I'd really like to just give them a few more pieces of information about my story just to round it out so they have a the whole picture. Um I, what we were taking aspirin to prevent the clots. When I felt like I couldn't breathe and that I felt like I had pneumonia, the reason we went to the ER is so we could get chest x-rays. And they did the chest x-ray and sure enough, I had pneumonia in my right lower lobe. Now the doctor there put me on a Z-pack, but then the doctor that was helping me behind the scenes got me on the, the steroids and so I don't know which was more helpful, but I, my gut tells me it's probably the steroids because I felt like I had pleurisy in my back right lobe and I still have a little bit left, but it's going. So I slept on my couch sitting up, you know, kind of in a slanted position so that I was not putting any pressure on my back so that my lungs could expand and, and do what they needed to do. So I definitely recommend not laying in bed if you've got, um, any concerns about pneumonia or anything like that. Um, or if you're going to lay down, you want to lay on using... your stomach because you can breathe much better laying on your stomach versus your back. Right. And he said, to, I personally, I can't sleep on my stomach. It just, it hurts my back. I, I could be comfortable. So you got to do what you got to do. But that, that was my solution. Um, the other thing is I also had contact with the respiratory therapist. And I said, all right, I, you know, my fatigue is gone, but I'm concerned about my lungs not healing properly. He said, well, Susan, it's now time for you to start rehabbing your lungs. You can't be a couch potato. So he had me, I had already ordered one of these from Amazon. They're very inexpensive, like nine bucks. It's called a, um, what is this called? Spirometer? Yeah. And it's super easy to use. You're just and your goal is to get, you know, the, this white thing to come up and you're, it's, it's, it's called an incentive spirometer. So you're incentivized to hit the goal and you're trying to build your lung capacity. So that's the first and easiest thing to do. And you want to start doing it. You know what, my, what my lungs hurt. I didn't want to do it. And one of the things that Dr. Youngberg 
very gently yelled at me about it. I said, Susan, you got to keep doing everything. You can't stop. And I was like, ah, but I don't want to, but I will. Okay. So make yourself do all this stuff that you don't want to do because it's going to save your life. And then the second thing the respiratory therapist told me is, Susan, you got to start exercising. And I said, well, it's too hot and muggy to go outside. And plus he was telling me I needed to wear a mask. And so I don't want to, I can't breathe with a mask outside. I'm not going to do that. So, but I had a rebounder, which is a mini trampoline in the house. And I knew from prior, you know, seminars and stuff, how valuable those are. It's kind of like a passive form of exercise. It's super easy and they don't cost very much. You, you can get one um, pretty easily in lots of different places. I think they may even have them at Walmart. I don't know. But um, just three minutes just to start out with. And then we also had an elliptical. So while my husband was doing his three minutes, I got on the elliptical and started doing that. And praise God, it wasn't a whole lot, but I could tell immediately I was getting stronger and my body was responding. So uh, this is a process and you just, you just keep going. You don't stop and you don't uh, wait for others to rescue you. You ask for lots and lots of help. You know, Dr. Youngberg, one of the questions we got, and I don't know if you have an answer for this, but how can we find physicians that can do early treatment in case we contract COVID? That's the big question for everybody. How do they find people to help them? Because it wasn't for you and this other doctor that you hooked me up with. I don't know that I'd be here. Well, there's more and more doctors uh, available through telemedicine in every state of the country that, that can help people with early at, at home interventions that where you can have even your medicines delivered to you directly at your home. Um, you know, and, and that's, you, you can learn more about that, that, that for instance, um, uh, the, the frontline uh, COVID critical care Alliance uh, has information on that. Uh, there, there's various places for that. Uh, but I, I want to emphasize here that the most important thing is to take advantage of these natural strategies early on. Uh, and, and I want to I want to finish here because our time's almost up. I want to finish with the, the rest of this article uh, where so so they they were basically they had complete bed rest. Uh, they ate a very meager diet and they used did fomentation, preferably three times a day. You do a hot cold showers three times a day and then rest, rest, rest in between that, eat very, very simply. And then, and then the next danger is you start feeling better and go like, oh, now I can get that, you know, answer all my emails and, and the phone calls and all these other things. And don't do that. You got to rest. And here's, here, again, this is when people were dying like flies from the Spanish flu. And, and um, they said that the, the way that nobody got seriously ill or died in this entire school of 100, 190 people who got infected um, was that they, uh, they were told to stay, at, stay in bed and rest for another two to five days after they felt apparently well. In other words, the body's got to really recuperate. So. So take the time to recuperate because if you don't and it gets you, it gets you again, now you're dealing with the very most dangerous viruses that never got killed. Not, not just the run of the mill viruses, but all the most dangerous viruses that, that, that didn't get killed the first time. So they, they go on to say as a result of this system of handling uh, the Spanish flu, it is scoring thousands of victims every day there has not been one case that could have been called serious or a single death in that seminary, uh, although there were more than 90 affected. The record is remarkable, and they end with this statement. It makes the ordinary methods of dealing with the flu appear irrational. <laughs> okay, so, so that's, that's a lesson from more than 100 years ago. Okay, and unfortunately, a lot of us aren't even aware of that, so I wanted to share that information. That is that is critical, and let me let me wrap this up by saying that uh, that it that temperance is important. You know, uh, alcohol impairs your immune system. So if you're at risk, don't drink alcohol. Uh, don't don't smoke. If you're at risk, that uh, avoid the things that put you at risk of getting sick. Um, and and then I'm gonna I'm gonna share screen as as a last thing. I'm gonna show you a study that was done that was done by. Um, 
um, it was published in the British Medical Journal. Okay, and um, it, uh, and it's so that if you eat a plant-based diet, you have 73% lower risk of, of, if you get COVID, of getting severe uh, illness within COVID. So just being on a plant on a healthy plant-based diet decreased your risk of getting severe COVID by 73% compared to those not on a plant-based diet. Uh, what's more, if you were on a low, low carbohydrate, high protein diet, which seems to be all that much more popular today, you're four times more likely to get serious illness of COVID than that person on a plant-based diet. So that should, that should tell you something right there. Uh, so, so take advantage of those systems, ventilate the rooms, open the windows, get a lot of fresh air in, uh, make sure that you're not stressing yourself out, make sure you're thinking about forgiving others and, and asking forgiveness if you've done something wrong. And I'll end with this quote, forgiveness is the only prescription in the entire universe that is powerful enough to unlock the chemical bonds of hostility, resentment, and bitterness. Okay, uh, so forgiveness as the best stress management technique that will dramatically empower the immune system. So be thinking about those things during this time of the Delta and variant and in the future in the Lambda variant as well. Very good, thank you. Let me just say one more thing. This is kind of what I'd like to round up my testimony on this thing. When I was at my sickest point, I was angry because I knew my husband was just as sick as I was. And I was angry that I was responsible for his health as well as mine. And the Lord impressed on me, Susan, you let go of this. You focus on letting me take care of you and you take care of your family. You, you love them. You put that all that bitterness and fear and all of that aside. And when I did that, that's when everything started turning around. So your comment about forgiveness and laying aside bitterness and uh, really emphasizing love and unselfishness is so critical to this whole process. Do not let fear drive us in these things. One more thing, I, I didn't get to mention this. This is called NanoGreen. This is a product that Dr. Youngberg told me about probably two years ago. And, uh, this is one of the things that I ordered, and, and I, I don't know where all I can get it besides through you, but, and it's not that this a particular lot of places brand is like that available. It's basically a concentrated green leafy vegetable powder. Uh, so there's various, there's nitro greens, nano greens, there's various options out there. And it's a way to get a lot of nutrition without any real calories. <laughs> Well, yeah, so it's, and my point is you want to do something like this as a daily smoothie so that you're getting this high concentrated nutrition. That's my point. So whether it's this or something else that you get at the health food store, just get a high nutrition a supplement like that that helps get all your nutrients in you. Well, I know we're out of time. Uh, we've got a couple minutes over. Let's just tell you about our next webinar so you can put it on your calendar. Our next one's going to be on September 20th at 4 p.m. And the, uh, the topic is the upside of barriers along your health journey. You know, one thing's clear with all of this is, you know, we can't pre prevent bad things from happening. Bad things are going to happen when they're already happening to everybody, all kinds of bad things. So what, what the question is, what do we do about it? How do we respond? And that's really going to be the emphasis of our next webinar is, um, you know, Brighton Heights, what we envision for this community is to be an infrastructure for, for individuals who want to come live here to support them in their journey, because all that stuff is still going to happen. The question is, can you get the support you need in that journey to be successful and to navigate as successfully as you can? and to live a life of vitality with purpose and all of those things. So we're just so excited to round this thing out with this idea of what is the upside of barriers and how do you respond to those? So we look forward to having you join us and um, we'll see you in a month. Thank you for your time. <laughs>